Southeastern Bow Hunter Podcast. Guys, we got a legend with us again. You know, I've been bugging him and bugging him and bugging him, and I feel terrible about it. I apologize already about three times, it feels like, but we got Mr. Travis T-Bone Turner, Mr. Local Legend, freaking just huge name in the industry. Thank you. Thank God that I was able to get you back on, man. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, dude, tell us what's been going on with you. You know, obviously everybody knows who you are. So what's uh, what's this past season been like? How's the family? How's Bone Collector? What's what's up? Yeah, all's good. Um, you know, just continuing still to to adapt to the new uh, lifestyle and the, the things that's been dealt. But all good. Every four months I have a cancer checkups and they don't ever like to say cancer free but um you know every time everything comes back clear um you know trying to lose a little weight it didn't jump on there quick so it's not going to come off quick so we're trying to do that and you know stay active as far as all the projects we have between land management and taking care of our farms and and uh you know farms that we've we've bought and trying to polish up as well as uh we got a house that we're renovating a next door we, we we bought a house about three years ago and um, we're trying to get it renovated, um, either for a mother-in-law or my son might be moving into that. So we're really deep diving into that. So there's all kinds of projects and stuff going on. And then of course, you know, working with all of our partners and still, you know, flinging arrows and anything to do in the archery dojo and, and, and such we're, we're, uh, knee deep into that as always. So uh, a lot of the same things are great at bone collector. Um, uh, you know, naturally what L is busier than a, one-legged man in a butt kicking contest right now with a uh, with turkey season going on so he he stays super duper duper busy uh with that and then you know uh I've, i'm gonna be uh, trying to kill a couple turkeys here in georgia might slide over to alabama to get one but uh definitely gonna hunt some here in georgia so uh more of the same just doing it one-legged <laughs> <laughs> oh man you gotta love the extra challenge right Oh yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's awesome, dude. Yeah. I, uh, I've been keeping up with, you know, obviously you guys all the time. I mean, Wadi has been, first off, I know that all of y'all had a great season, right? Yeah, we did. Yeah. You guys really had a knockout season. Uh, and I saw Waddell post something the other day, already killing turkeys. And I'm like, dude, didn't season just start <laughs> like, yeah. down in Florida, like two or three weeks ago. That's right. Um, yeah. Yeah. He always yeah. makes a Florida trip and, got a couple of great places to go down there and uh some good friends that we always uh well i say we we always share camp with but it seems like what else the only one that gets to go share camp with them so <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay he's the lead dog we understand we know our role yeah yeah he man it's crazy to me like when i talked to him um man when's the last time i heard from him it's probably like after new year's i think and i was like uh i was asking him you know what's what's coming up and he was naming all these different shows. And I think I texted him the day that he landed for ATA. And I was, I had a question that, I mean, maybe you can answer it for me, but mm -hmm. um, he, you know, I got to try out that new bone collector scent line that you guys have. Yeah. And it was, it was great. I mean, it really was. And the one thing I didn't understand though, like how to use it or, you know, the, the method, I guess, is that bedding scent. Is there any sort of trick to that? Like, where would you put that? When would you put it out? I mean, what's it's just, it's basically a calming type scent, you know, basically it lets the deer know that it's, it's been in a bedding area or, you know, the inner digital scent, that, that type of thing. So it lets the deer know that, uh, it's a, it's a, a passive area to where that they can relax. Um, just a familiar scent, so to speak, you know, anything like that, that, that makes them familiar is, um, you know, it's worth a try, you know, um, uh, I know that, that, uh, the mock scrape stuff that we've been using with that has been working really, really well. Um, so, you know, in areas where you can't bait, you can uh, try that as well as it's another way of getting pictures in between areas of bedding and in between areas of, uh, where they're feeding, of course, or near your bait station. So a lot of times you might not get a mature buck to come to, uh, you know, a feed pile or whatever, just because they're, you know, kind of leery about it, but you can always get them to check a scent post of some sort just to get a picture and kind of give you an idea of his travel uh, patterns. Yeah, that man, the whole mock scrape stuff like that, that's something I'm really going to start trying to use more this year. 
I mean, last year I used it and it was working. I still had scrapes getting hit uh, into February, which yeah. was crazy. And I even had bucks holding till about two weeks ago. And yeah, ours, ours all, all mine seem to drop pretty early this year. I mean, not, not like too early, but it just seems like instead of it being over a three month period, it just seems like they all did it within a two month time. It, uh, I mean, two, two or three weeks ago, I had no bucks that still had any horns on them. So, uh, worked out pretty good this year but so do you think like i guess so me me and my buddy thor have been having this conversation for a couple weeks now um i had my my target buck last year the one that i actually could have killed um or at least had a chance to he shed one side in november he got super sick i think i I don't know if you remember i sent you the photo and was like yeah uh i found the shed and it was clean on the base like just definitely Super sick, shed one side. Why? I don't know. But he then shed earlier than everybody else. He wasn't sick. He just dropped it. Um, and he's already starting to get like about two inch nubs. Yeah. And so I was like, oh, dude, he's going to grow quick. You know, maybe he'll grow bigger because it's earlier or something. I don't know. And he he and I got discussing it. And with his bucks still holding, and I had a few that were still holding too. Yeah. He thinks that trike might you know, rub out the velvet quicker, but then with the heat and how late they're holding it, he's thinking that we're going to maybe have a a good velvet season. Like meaning that, you know, when the season comes in, a lot of the bucks are still going to be in their velvet. I mean, do you think that that's kind of a thing or well, within Georgia? What, this is what I think. And it seems to have been over the years is because we don't have a defined rut like they do in the Midwest to where it's like, it's always the first two weeks of November. It seems like, just like you said, you're still seeing scrapes and you're still seeing some uh, rut activity even towards the end of the season, January, late December. Uh, you know, a lot of people call that the second and third rut, which it certainly could be. Um, but I think what you see, uh, the diversity across Georgia is you get rut activity starting middle October and it, and it kind of continues on through January. Mm-hmm. So therefore, you're going to see deer start dropping their fawns that got impregnated early, you're going to see them dropping their fawns early, like at the, you know, middle to end of April, first of May, and then you'll see them dropping as late as August. So with that said, your buck that you're talking about, um, a combination of maybe nutrients and or uh, the drought the, the, the year before and or he was just a, he was dropped. I mean, he was born early. So he started his progression of, of Mm -hmm. uh, things he does each year. Um, you know, you're just going to get some that drop. I mean, we had a, a buddy of ours that, that uh, we usually always find one or two sheds in December. And uh, we had a buddy of ours. He killed a, a extremely large deer this year. And, and that deer, he was having, he, he really tried hard to get it early this year. And he did. It was a big deer. It was a, a high 160s deer. But it was just real massive. I mean, when I say real massive, I mean, it had uh, 47 inches of mass on one side. On one side, just 47 inches of, I mean, it, wow. absolutely unbelievable. Yeah, it was huge. I mean, it, it, it literally, well, I posted some pictures of it, but I mean, it really did look like a moose. It was a freak. Um, Didn't have a, a, a ton of time length, but, you know, nonetheless, it was a big deer. But yeah. every year that deer was seven, seven plus years old. But every year he was dropping in December, you know, because he was hunting him hard back on a feeding pattern. But I just really think in, uh, I mean, it can happen anywhere, but it's more so here in the Southeast that we have such a gray rut, not a defined two week rut that you're, you're going to see some bucks, you know, lose their horns early. Some does come into estrus early. Some does come into estrus late. And I believe it's all in accordance as to when they are born. You know, if they're born in April, that sets their yearly time up uh, as far as that goes. And if they're born in August, you know, they're, four months behind the, the rest of the deer. So they're going to be a late bloomer, so to speak. So I, I think that's what we run into down here now, by no means, is that anything scientific? I am not Dr. Deer. That is a redneck <laughs> evaluation, but I, I think it's got a little, uh, it holds a little weight. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, and that's one thing too, that I noticed this year is like the last year that I killed was January 8th, 10th. I don't know, a couple of days before regular season went out and um, it was a doe. And I mean, she was fully in rut. Like I walked, it was really weird because I've never walked up on a deer and been able to smell them. I could smell this deer. Yeah. And 100% a doe. Like, and, and so I guess 
I may have asked you about this before, but like her hawks were black. Why is that? I thought only Bucks did that. No, no, I think I think those do too as well. And not, not to mention, you know, I mean, just depends on how she squats and stuff. And True. she gets a little stink on her. And if she's been bred, you know, there's there could be some juices coming from the buck as well. So mm, yeah, they're that. they're they're not as nice and pretty as Disney makes them out to be. They be yeah. stinky too. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah, I just it it kind of did show me too, because I mean, the the one thing that I've noticed on one of my properties um, that you and I have talked about a couple times, October 25th, if there is a big buck anywhere near that property and he's showing up, you know, beforehand or whatever, that's when he daylights. Yeah. Like literally two years in a row, I've got pictures of big deer daylighting on this property and I'm always at work. So yeah. I made the decision. I am definitely taking the 25th off this year. This will probably be the one year it doesn't happen. Right. Yeah. But, uh, you're, I mean, you're right about the rut. You know, we do have a weird rut here because yep. I've seen rutting activity start as early as the first or second week of October. That's right. And I'm talking like fighting, like going at it. Yeah. And then they're still holding and still hitting scrapes and all that stuff, you know, and even fighting still into February. So yeah. I feel like it makes it harder, you know, down here. It, it's, it, it changes almost every single county, it feels like. You know? Yeah, and and, and uh, you know the Georgia Outdoor News does a pretty good job. Their map kind of shows it, so to speak. Like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, if I had to pick the best week in my area, uh, if you'll notice their map every year, it, it's got one little old uh, C section of the portion of my county and stuff, and it and it holds pretty true. Meaning most every other part of the state, they're calling for like the fifth through the eleventh to be the peak of the rut, and uh, it always seems to be like the nineteenth through the first part of December here, hmm. if you had to pick a, a, a good week here. And I don't know if that's so close because I'm so close to Alabama because, you know, you can go right across the river over into Alabama and their rut doesn't even start till January. Yeah. They're not even in rut till the end of January. So, yeah, they're, when, when they're in is just uh, d depends on the strain of deer and, and where they're at, and it kind of holds true to that. But that's why, uh, you know, for as a bow hunter, I don't really care to – I'm not as excited about hunting the rut as I am as about, you know, working off their feeding and bedding patterns mm -hmm. and travel corridors. You know, everybody says when they go on a trip out West, you know, like, man, we want to plant it during the rut. And you will see a lot, you know, like if you're doing a Midwest hunt, you will see a lot of action and it will be absolutely action packed. But as far as pattern in that deer, and that holds true for down here too. There's I mean, no it, yeah, there's no chance. You don't, you, I mean, they're not doing the same thing every day. I mean, you may get a picture of a of a buck today and you know he's gone for on a, to a neighbor's farm for the next four or five six days or even longer if you know if he's on a hot doe so um you know as a bow hunter um i you know i tend to to like a little bit of the pre-rut where it's a little more predictable or you know let them get through the 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 rut portion and come back to post rut that way they're more on their bellies the only disadvantage to after uh, rut is uh they they tend to be bu busted up some from fighting and stuff but um you know i i'm i'm always a fan i mean if somebody was hunting me they could dang sure uh uh track me down by <laughs> sitting out in front of mcdonald's <laughs> for pizza Hut long before they could out of uh my, me and my my and my wife's bedroom <laughs> <laughs> oh man I... way more predictable the way you explain things dude it's so funny <laughs> i love it well you gotta um, make uh, us rednecks that gotta you gotta put it into layman's terms or redneck terms that's the way they that's the way they catch hold yeah. kind of a theo vaughnism huh <laughs> yeah. you ain't kidding man uh but i do agree i mean you know you remember pickles the deer over here on the wall he he came to feed and trike that big six point before he shed the second week of season the same exact weekend that i killed this deer a year after or i guess i killed him a year before came to feed and like you can really pattern these guys early season and to me as much as i hate hot weather early season is my favorite time you know oh, yeah. because you can hunt later and you know that they're going to come in yep i personally don't like the rut I've only had one good experience in the rut and it's not even really a good experience. It's just that giant that I saw in public a few years back. Yeah. Other than that, I actually got played this year. They're speaking of, you know, deer fighting and breaking times and stuff. This one buck that I was watching since the summer over on public, 
he was sticking around some. And so I was hunting, you know, over a mock scrape that I had seen him hit before, just not daylight at. And so I go on the last archery hunt um, over at this WMA and don't see anything. Right. I don't see a single thing. So whatever that season's over, no big deal. I pull my cameras back in February. He daylighted three days. Wow. Three days after that season went out. And he only had two times left. Yeah. And before that, he was a big eight. And that, then that photo I got was like a five point, maybe, maybe. Yeah. I, honestly, I could pull it up and look. But yeah, you're you're right, dude. I mean, our rut is weird. It just it just is. You yeah, and the and the the rut also is. Um, I mean, you know, if you've got a deer that even if it it you know it depends on the land, how much land you got, and if you've only got a small you know portion or whatever, and let's just say that you're only getting nighttime pictures of the a mature buck. Yeah, your chances of getting some daylight pictures, you know, they're going to slip up and get a little crazy. So, you know, if you got time, it's an enjoyable time to sit in the woods. But, you know, it's it's hard to predict them. But it can make those nocturnal vi- vampires, you know, show up in the daytime some. So, you know, there there are some um, uh, positives to it. But for the most part, you know, if you've got a chance to hunt an unpressured area, you know, I like I like uh, making sure that, you know, that you're they're coming and going from feed to bed. Uh, it just seems a lot more predictable where you can get in and out, you got a, a lot more chances of getting him and figuring out the, the chess match, you know, rather than just like, Hey, I'm going to sit it out. I'm going to grind it out and get calluses on my butt. I'm going to sit here for four <laughs> days straight while they're, they're rutting and let's just see what happens. And, you know, maybe I'll catch him sliding by here. So. So what you're saying is the, the deadly combo would be some feed and then that bedding scent we talked about and just set it up to where you could catch them. Potentially. Yeah. Potentially. Oh, have to try it. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. I opened that that case, man, and it 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 about slapped me in the face. That stuff uh-huh. is strong. My wife was sitting right over on the other side of the bed when I opened it. And yeah. She gave me that look, like, what is that? I'm like, hey, <laughs> nothing yeah. spilled, man. I don't know. That stuff is it. And I pulled it out, and because I was trying to figure out what the smell was, I thought maybe something like you know poured out. No, just picked up that old can and took a whiff and about threw up and was like, okay, yeah. that's, that's going to work. <laughs> so, yeah. Yep. Yeah, man, that I, I'm excited to see what else happens with that line. I, so is that, I guess going back to that, would, would, you know, before we move on from it, would you suggest using that anytime or wait? The bedding? Until, yeah. The bedding scent. Would you use that now or would you wait until a little closer to season? I would wait a little closer to season. Um, okay. Use something more of a, uh, um, you know, a straight interdigital scent that we have, or you have, just a, a buck scent fever, you know, if you're trying to get pictures on a, a mock scrape, I wouldn't use it necessarily, you know, now I'd wait till they have their horns and stuff like that. Got it. Um, right now I, I try to just keep the deer unpressured and let them get used to traveling on your land. And, you know, if you're able to have, you know, good high protein food plots and or supplemental feed, stay out of there and let them just absolutely love being on your property. That way, the more time they spend there and the more time that they are comfortable and learn the property, the more time they're going to be there when you're hunting them. Cause if you high pressure them now, they're going to be like, man, I, I mean, what's, what's changed since spring. That guy's on there all the time. I ain't yeah. going back to that piece of property period. So, you know, low pressure just doesn't mean that, you know, the week you're hunting them, low pressure means all year long. Mm-hmm. You got to go in on that property, you know, only go in like midday. Uh, you know, don't go in the first three hours of daylight or the last three hours, try to do everything midday. And then don't go in a lot, you know, just basically stay off of it if you possibly can. Yeah. And I tried that last season and it worked. I mean, it really worked. I had yeah. about four or five shooter books show up on this one property. I only hunted four times and I was blown away. So, yeah, I mean, I used to not believe that. Right. Like back when I first started hunting, I used to think, you know, oh, well, that's nah, that can't be right. I'll just put a ton of this good smelling feet out and every deer in the county is going to show up. Wow. If anything, it made it harder. Well, they will, but they'll do it at, you know, one in the morning. That's know? what I mean. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I try to tell, you know, you, you know, there's a, there's a lot of different tactics, but the one category that is going to get you more daylight sightings and, and help you more successful is to, is low pressure. Mm-hmm. You know, let your cameras do your work. You know, everybody's going to use them. Everybody's got them. You might as well let your cameras do the work, stay out of there and let them deer feel comfortable and let their guard down and, you'll have way more successful daylight activity than you will, especially on mature stuff yeah. than you will any other thing that you do. Yeah. I mean, I was on a six, a six year old at least this year. And it, granted, I don't, I don't 
think he ever daylighted. He was weird this year, man. He was very weird. But look, it's April now. Today's actually April Fool's, the day that we're recording this. Um, yeah. So, you know, I, I feel like, yes, people are talking about turkeys. Yes, people are, you know, if they're crazy like me, they're still trying to find deer with antlers, even though we all know they're not going to have them. But one thing I know that is really getting ramped up is 3D season. Yep. And with that comes different builds, bow builds, arrow builds. So before we dive into all of that, what is your current bow build? I know you guys probably got the new Hoyts. Um, what What's T-Bone shooting this year? Yeah, I am um, pretty much the same arrow that I've shot in the last few years. Um, I'm always tinkering, of course. Um, I'm shooting the the Alpha X. I'm, I went to the shorter one nor normally with my draw length. I like a little longer axle to axle. Uh, I'm going with the shorter one because now I'm primarily hunting out of ground blinds and uh, just, you know, I need the, 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 not that it's that much difference. It's only three inches axle to axle, but I just want the most clearance that I possibly can get from being in a, a ground blind or a small uh, uh, confined area. Odds are I'm not, you know, not going to be taking long shots when it comes to deer hunting. I mean, we, we shoot two or three times a week around here and, uh, you know, we're always shooting at a hundred and something yards and stuff, but I'm just doing it all with my short axle to axle bow. We're having fun. We're shooting our tournaments, our knockbusters tournaments on Thursday night. So we're doing that. And, and, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm just getting, you know, really acclimated to the new bow. Uh, I do have an RX eight, uh, the, the, the ultra, which is the 34 inch axle to axle. Um, I hunted with it some last year. I, um, and I just wanted something a little bit more maneuverable in a blind. So I am shooting the, the shorter one and I'm a little over 29 inch draw. I usually tell people, you know, from a hunting standpoint and especially with a whitetail uh, setup, you know, if you're 29 inches or definitely under 29 inches, you can get away with shooting the 29 and 30 and 31 inch axle to axle. Mm -hmm. Usually if you're 29 or longer, I try to steer someone towards the longer axle to axle and you can, you can, you know, you don't have to adhere to that, but that's just a decent rule of thumb. Yeah. Um, you know, like I say, I'm like 29 and three eighths, 29 and a quarter, and I'm shooting, you know, a 31 inch axle to axle and, it, and it's performing really well, doing good. Um, shooting about 74 pounds. Um, the, the setup is extremely quiet. The new cams that they have, Hoyt has the adjustable, uh, there are quarter inch increments, which is something that that uh you know nobody's done is to adjust the cam with the inner module quarter inch and what that does is more than just being able to adjust it down to a quarter inch because you can always twist a string or let a cable out to adjust to accommodate that but being able to do it on the module side along with having the draw stop to where you can adjust it from 70 75 80 and 85 percent let off that means that you can increase the draw force curve increase the power stroke and then shorten up the the draw stop to where you can manipulate the the way the draw force curve is the length of the valley if you will so that you have so many options as to how you want that to feel so if you if you're a person that likes a really long valley you can you can shorten the bow up and then lengthen out the draw stop to where you have a really long valley to where it really you know some people like a little sponge or like it to where they can creep a little bit and not worry about the bow taking it away from them and then if you want the ultimate speed or you like a good crisp shot where you're shooting, you know, back tension and stuff, you can take that valley out, increase the draw force curve, lengthen your draw length a little bit longer than you normally would shoot. And then you can shorten that um, uh, draw stop to where you're you're stopping your draw length in the very front of the valley so that the draw force curve is a lot longer. So there's a lot of advantages to that huh. uh, in doing so. So. A lot of different uh, additions and innovations that they've had. So uh, um, it, it's it's really appreciated on my end as far as a, 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 a tinker or archery guru. So, yeah, I'm real happy with that. And I've always been a fan of a, a, a quiet bow. You know, all the things that we do, you uh, you know, if you're shooting light arrows and you're, you know, borderline dry firing your bow, it's just going to make the bow more noisy, more noisy, more noisy. And, you know, I really think a quiet bow is a, extremely quiet uh, – um, um it's extremely helpful as far as the deer dropping this you know they're all they're going to drop you can't make it whisper quiet but you can't get one too quiet and then of course uh you know 
I, I've, I've gotten to be since in the last two or three years, you know, you and I always talk about weights of arrows and FOC and things like that. But when you talk about an arrow, you know, it's real easy to say, yeah, I shoot a light arrow. Yeah, I shoot a heavy arrow. Well, I try not to say that anymore. And the reason why I say that is because one man's definition of light is another man's definition of heavy and vice versa. So, um, I, you know, I don't like to say heavy arrow. And, and you know, and my version of a heavy arrow may not be the same version as the next guy's version of a heavy arrow. So, you know, I'm shooting about a 500 and I think it's 516 grain arrow. I'm shooting the uh, Sirius Archery Geminis uh, in a 250 spine. And the reason I'm shooting a higher spine is so that I can manipulate the the FOC, I can put more weight up there if I need to, but overall weight, um, my overall weight is not necessarily determined on a certain weight that I want to shoot, but basically I build the bow to the weight that I want to hold weight wise and draw wise so that I can do that comfortably. And then I shoot the, shoot the arrow and then I manipulate my FOC and arrow weight to where I end up with a feet per second that I'm comfortable with. There's a range there that I want to end up in, meaning like um, if it ends up being extremely fast, like 310 feet a second, I don't need that extra speed. That speed yeah. is not doing anything for me, in my opinion. I would have to be able to, I would have to be shooting out to, you know, 60, 70, 80 yards at critters for that to really show up in my pin gap. And I don't really need that. So I'm going to take all that energy and uh, innovation and I'm going to harness it into a quieter arrow, a more forgiving arrow, and I'm going to put a little more weight in the arrow, a little more uh, higher FOC, and I'm going to bring that speed down, not changing my holding weight, not changing my draw length, not changing my pulling weight, and I'm going to pull that that weight of that arrow, heavy it up some, and get it down to where I'm looking at a speed window of somewhere between 265 to 290. That's where I want to be. And when I land there, whatever it lands on, whether it be 540 grain arrow or it could be like the bow's not that fit efficient and i could have to shoot a 475 grain arrow mm -hmm. and that's fine yeah that's totally fine as long as i'm achieving the speed that i want at the weight that i want and the holding weight that i want uh so there's more to look at than just saying good bad or otherwise hey i'm going in i'm shooting a 575 grain arrow you can't look at it that way you know Everything you change on one end affects this other end. Mm -hmm. So you have to look at the big picture. I will say I don't like to be under 450, but there are applications for certain people that under 450 is A-OK. -okay. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of deer have been killed with a 450 or 425 grain arrow by all means. Me personally, with my draw length and the amount of weight that I pull, I don't want to be under, I don't have to be, I'm fortunate enough. I don't want to be under 450 grains. So I like at least 450 grains and try to achieve right around that 500. If I can get the speeds that I want, the holding weights that I want, the pulling weight that I want, the FOC that I want, and all keep it in that uh, speed range and weight range and everything under the umbrella falls in at around 500 grains and around 275 feet per second. Well, I've hit a home run. And in today's bow, no matter if it's a Hoyt or any other brand, I think you can do that unless yeah. you're unless you're not able to pull, you know, you can only pull 50, 55 pounds or you're only a 26-inch draw length. There are some hurdles. But if you're a, I call it a meat and potatoes, Billy Joe lunch bucket type of hunter, then you can achieve that. So yeah. I think that's what we need We need to go for. Yeah, I mean, that, you know, it's funny you say all of that because I, I, pretty much experienced it with this new bow. Um, you know, cause last year I was shooting uh bear paradox and it's max pull was 60 pounds. That's just how I bought it for my buddy. And, um, you know, I was shooting a 450 grain arrow and I, I will say that at those speeds, I think the bow was, or the arrow was probably moving at like two, maybe two forty, Right. You know, cause at the time I was 28 inch draw, then I got refit with this new bow. I'm 27 and a half. Um, but it's also, let me think three, no, this new bow is 348 IBO, which I know that's not actual speed, but still, um, it's much faster. Yep. I can pull 10 pounds more. I could max it out to 72 if I wanted to, sure. but like you were saying with the adjustable let off, I started noticing that this specific bow likes to try and jump forward a lot. Yeah. Real short. Uh, like I'm gonna, yeah. Like I'm going to, you know tone it down just a little bit so now i've got it where it doesn't really want to do that much um 
but yeah, like going through that whole thing, you know, I think I've probably gone through like three different arrow setups with this new bow, but the first setup I had when I, when I first got it set up over at ACE, um, I think I was shooting 269 with a 450, I believe 450 grain arrow. Um, that was 28 inches, 70 pounds. Now my, I had another setup built, uh, from Nimrod. I think they're at like 490. I want to say it's 262. Yeah. And then the new arrow setup I'm getting, uh, cause he just dropped a new set of five mils. Uh, I believe it, total arrow weight is going to be like 462, 465. And so I should be somewhere in between that. Right. right. And I remember when I first started listening to you, um, like years ago, I had a bow that I didn't, I did not know how to calculate any, any speed. Right. So I'm just going off the IVO. I hear you say, Oh, you want to be somewhere between two, you know, 280, right? Like say you said 280, dude. I thought I was zipping around shooting almost 300 foot a second. Come to find out I was maybe shooting 200. Yeah. So like you and I have had this discussion too about, you know, arrow weight a lot. You've mm -hmm. always been my go-to guy with this stuff. And, you know, speed was something that I never truly understood up until recently. And uh, everyone I've talked to, you included, my buddy Bergie, Josh, every, basically everybody but Troy. <laughs> and I'm not knocking Troy at all. I love Troy. But basically everyone – that hunts, you know, a wide range of different animals will tell you that speed's pretty important and that you don't need to have a stupid heavy arrow there. Are, like you said before, there's applications for everything. Well, yeah. and then, and then also like I, like I began my statement there, uh, your, your, uh, speed, uh, speed is relative to what someone, you know, to me, a 200 grain, 280 grain hunting arrow is a fast hunting arrow. Yeah. But to a guy that shoots tournaments all the time and, you know, like uh, the 3D guys, you know, they're achieving 280 pretty easy. So, you know, to them, and this is, and and I, I guess I'm going to, this is something that that bothers me. And I guarantee you, you know, someone like yourself or, or you know, people just getting into it, get sucked into this. You, you're, you're both you're shooting now. You just said earlier that it, it's IBO rating at 348, right? <laughs> That's a 350 grain arrow at 70 pounds at 30 inch draw. Yeah. In my opinion, and I guarantee you, Josh, Josh and I, all of us have had, we're, we're comparing, we're, we're trying to achieve something or they're advertising and the bow manufacturers are pushing something that is not attainable or yeah. is not, meaning it is a true speed. However, mm -hmm. Nobody shoots a 350 grain arrow except for kids or women. All right. Very few people are 38, 38 inch, 30 inch draw. Most people, the average draw length, I would say, is like 28, 28 and a half is about the average draw length. Yeah. And in this day and age, most people are not pulling 70 pounds. They're probably pulling, you know, 65 pounds at most. Mm -hmm. So, right off the bat, to a guy that is not got a lot of experience behind him, you know, someone like a guru of so sorts. First thing you do is if you're looking through magazines and you see 348, you walk mm -hmm. into, you know, your Ace Hardware down there and you say, I want this bow. And, you know, I've been reading about it, studying online. It's 348 feet a second. You plop down $1,800 for the bow. You sit there and get it all set up. You're nearly $3,000 in, which is basically you got butterflies in your stomach because, you know, your wife is going to be just absolutely madder and fire that you're about to spend $3,000 on a setup. <laughs> If you still have one after that. Yeah. <laughs> and you've done all this research and you're like, honey, but this is the one that's shooting 348 foot a second. The guy gets you all set up, even with some arrows. And he's supposedly got you set up with some fast arrows and you're a 28 inch draw. And you go back there and it's the, the moment of truth. Let me pop it through the meter. Boom. 271. Yep. You want to talk about the in the 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 wind blowing out of your sail. It makes it so hard as a former retail shop owner mm -hmm. or anybody it makes it so hard so the manufacturers are making it very hard for the dealer who is the middleman between the consumer and all the great marketing that the manufacturer's been doing this guy's got to sit there with a towel and hand you a towel dry your tears hug your back <laughs> feed you and get you something to drink 
to talk you off a cliff because you just spent three thousand dollars on a bow that is that is sixty feet per second slower than what the manufacturer said it would do. Yep. But real world is that's not that's not real world. Yeah. I wished I wished that we could somehow between ATA uh, Archery Manufacturers Organization come up with a standard measurement in which something is attainable, something more like a twenty eight inch draw, a four hundred and fifty grain arrow at 65 pounds and then anything more than that would be a bonus and easy to sell anything less than that it's easy to explain because you're a shorter draw length you're not able to pull the weight and we got you with a heavier arrow yeah when you set the standard of way all things are measured it's about like going to buy a corvette and the guy says oh yeah this thing will do 250 miles an hour when are you ever going to do 250 miles an hour exactly when are you going to be able to see when that car will go zero to 60 in, you know, 2.8 seconds, it, you ain't going to be able to do it. It's just yeah. something that their speed sells and that's the way it's been for so long. And it makes it so hard. We could, we could do our whole industry a lot better service by bringing that standard down mm -hmm. to more something that is real world numbers. Yeah. Like a Realistic. Screen. Yes, exactly. So I've been thinking about that a lot. Well, a lot lately, but you know, it's going to take, the whole organization to understand that and to agree to it rather than like, you know, one bow company jumping off and doing it because they're going to be left aside when they put down there and said, you know, real honey number, here's our real honey number, mm -hmm. low decibels on the quietness of the bow, which is good. And here's a hunting setup for, you know, 271 feet per second. Yeah. Whereas these fake numbers that are flying around, nobody shoots IBO legal. And here's the thing. IBO legal, what is that? International bow hunting organization. Now, wouldn't you mm -hmm. think that IBO, if they're the bow hunting organization, they would be putting a number out there that is, you know, I'm not going to say like a, you know, an Ashby number, like a 1200 grain era, yeah. but at least something that is more real world. But here they are, international bow hunting organization. It should be international target association, mm -hmm. 3D target association. <clears throat> excuse me pollen <clears throat> yeah i know i feel you <laughs> yeah <laughs> but anyway i'm sorry i got off on a little tangent on that but but um you know those numbers i mean it really you know to the average guy who's having to do do all this studying and and you know and talking the wife into it and she's agreed to it mm -hmm. you know, how many guys have felt absolutely gutted leaving a shop that they just plopped down they've been saving for three years to this is the year i'm getting a new bow I got three grand in this puppy. I'm going to have it for the next five to six years. And it's 60 foot a second slower than what he thought it was going to be. Yeah. He's got to shoot that thing gutted for the next six years. I mean, that's it. it I'm glad you brought that up. Um, it's crazy because I wasn't even thinking about that. That is something though that I've been having a problem with because when, <laughs> when I got that, you know, bear, right. The IBO was 330 or 335 or something like that or 333, I believe. Right. It, it really doesn't matter, but it was faster than what I had. So I go to the, to the shop and I'm thinking, OK, you know, I'm trying to do the math in my head, guessing. I know it's not going to be 333. Right. But I'm still thinking, well, I might be 260, 270, 280. And then I saw 240 and I was like, whoa, wait a minute. Like, OK, this is the bow I've got, so I'll use it. But that's not what I was thinking it was going to be. Right. Um, The thing that gets me, though, is like <laughs> so. When I, when that, when that sort of thing happens to me, regardless of what yeah, you feel, you feel like you just got screwed. Yeah. You feel well, like it, made me figure, it made me want to figure it out. Like, well, why yeah. is it saying this? But then it's saying it's almost a hundred foot per second slower. Yeah. So what's up? Right. So I start looking into it and I'm realizing, oh, there's a lot of, a lot of, uh, what's the word? Manipulation. Smoke and mirrors. Yeah. Smoke and mirrors. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so, like, oh, I didn't read the fine print. Yes. And yeah, the thing that gets like me, can, yeah, but it doesn't need to be that way. It I agree. I completely way. agree. So, yeah. like, there's a couple of companies I've seen that will say up to a certain speed, right? Yeah. That to me, I feel like is it's at least better because then you know, like, okay, I could go that fast. Doesn't mean I'm going to. Well, but, they used to. They used to have two numbers. They used to have a. It's an AMO number, which they don't do that anymore. Archery Manufacturers Organization was came along before ATA. Mm -hmm. So AMO was the standard. It's where we get the AMO standard is 
the distance between your your you know your bracket that's that holds your sight on those two holes. Yeah, that has to be the same distance so that all people's accessories fit all bows. Yeah, the size screw that you use for bolting a rest on is a five sixteenths by twenty four. It has to be the same for everybody. the The diameter of your stabilizer. All these things are manufacturers organization standards. Mm -hmm. So their speed was a 540 grain era at 30 inch draw and 60 pounds. Oh, wow. That was the AMO standard. But that number, you know, is going to be really, really slow compared yeah. to IBO. And then through the years, we just kind of don't even mention that. Let's just only talk about the, the high end. Yeah. So, so uh, yeah, I, I might start a, an online something other and see where it goes about what people think about that, because I can guarantee you all dealers would be for that because yeah. it makes the dealer's job a hard job because it's like, okay, the manufacturer's got the guy in the store here to purchase this bow from me with great marketing. And now here I am having to explain and talk him off a cliff of why that number's not, you're not going to attain that buddy. I mean, yeah. honestly, this is, he's got to resell. It makes his job harder to sell. So, uh, uh, and then the consumer is upset because unless he's really up to date and knows what he's getting into, um, you know, half the consumers that come in to get the new bow, they're like, they'll go tell their buddies if they don't shoot through the meter, they're going to go through there and say, Hey, I've done, I'm shooting 348 foot a second. And he mm -hmm. pops it through there and it's like, Oh my gosh, man, I thought I was buying a fast bow. I yeah. must have a lemon. The cams are wore out or the limbs are not spongy enough. You know, there to someone that doesn't know, think about it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Why is my bow not fast? I mean, that was me. That was literally yeah. me four years ago. Yeah, so I, I'm, I lived it. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about? But yeah, I, see, I think you were onto something there. If you, if they would just do like the, the average setup, twenty eight inches. Yep. And, and they could even do multiple tests. They could have a whole chart that says, "Hey, at twenty eight to twenty nine with sixty five or even sixty to seventy at these arrow weights, this is the speeds that we got. You're covering a lot of bases there rather than saying, Hey, this bow's 350. And then right. you set it for yourself. And you know, like, like me, a 350 foot per second bow at 27 and a half inches, 70 pounds. I mean, you know, 450 grain arrow, maybe fast, but like you said, not everybody is going to be shooting 70. So yeah. I mean, I'm right there with you. You I shoot am. a 350 grain arrow and you, you're, you know, that's borderline uh, dry firing a bow at 30 yeah. inches draw at 70 pounds. And it, it's not going to be quiet. It's going to sound like a screen door slamming on a cat's tail. I mean, it's going to be loud. So, so you know, th th no, nobody shoots that. I mean, just yeah. it, it just doesn't happen. Who, who shoots three? I mean, I, I would say that, you know, a lot of your tournament archers don't even shoot that. It's just, yeah. it's just not real. It's not real world speed. So, you know, it needs to be more real world. So did that come from like the speed craze? A few years ago? Well, you know, with um, I've been shooting ASA tournaments. Well, I not now, but I mean, but back in the day since ASA was ASA. But they came up with the speed in 1993, which was 280 feet per second. So yeah. that everything would be fair. That's a, that was an attainable speed that whether you was a 26-inch draw or you was a 31-inch draw, everybody could kind of attain that. And then that the guy with the long draw, like a Tim Gillingham, you know, he's going to be able to get tremendous amount of speed out of a bow because of his long draw and long power, uh, you know, in the power stroke. Mm -hmm. So back in the day of the longer draw archer could shoot faster. And therefore in unknown tournaments, when you didn't know how far things was, the flat trajectory was a, uh, was very, very important. So the speed was important in tournaments. Um, but, uh, it was unfair. So they wanted to make it fair. Plus, bows were blowing up you know and yeah. if you slow them down bows are not blowing up as much but ibo set that standard you know back in the 80s of five grains per pound of bow weight and that's measured at a 30 inch draw and 70 pounds that's 350 grain era and they haven't changed since i mean they haven't changed since so we, we definitely need to address that and see if we can't get it changed for sure yeah because i mean i i just it doesn't really bother me personally because i know better well, no, like, you, you, you've, you've done the deep dive. I mean, you, that's what I'm saying. You live like this on a new guy. basis. Yeah. yeah. But, but you're four years in to where you're understanding it now. Yeah. It shouldn't be that way. If we want to get people into bow hunting and buying hunting license and loving archery, 
you you want them to be able to have a great experience yeah. in their first you know month or two of even thinking about archery, not like. Okay, I bought a bow, and here's your four years to get over just getting screwed for three thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> I probably spent more than that. <laughs> no, I, I mean, yeah, I mean, you, yeah, uh, that's my point. Yeah, yeah, it's it, it is weird, man. Like, I feel like I kind of notice a pattern, right? You know, late summer, I'm happy with my setup, whatever. I'm that's what I'm going to use, and whatever happens throughout the season, like I told you earlier, had an arrow break mid season, completely changed setups, and it was for the better. Um, I went from mechanical to fixed blade from um, what was a three blade fixed blade to single bevel and all that other stuff. And I've found from tinkering with lighter arrows, like a 445 all the way up to 490, that there's a happy medium, I feel like, between 400 and 500. And that would be for like the average Joe. If you're going out west, yeah. you'd be closer to the 400 end. If you're like us, oh, southeast or midwest or whatever. I could see closer to the 500. And, and, and honestly, most people can't shoot the difference. You you take a 440 grain arrow and go all the way to 525. Most people can't shoot the difference and you're not going to tell anything, you know, you know, under 40 yards and yeah. they'll, they'll all kill a deer, you know, equally as well and, and have good penetration and stuff like that. So, you know, I'm not, I'm, it, it, it comes down to a, you know, a little more forgiving, uh, a, a little more foc you know it's nice to know that you've got that window to 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 kind of work with things in there because you can shoot a 450 grain arrow that has you know nine grain nine percent foc it's mm -hmm. not going to shoot as good as if you had a 475 that's got like a 13 or 14 percent foc so that that's nice to know it's not like there's not a hardcore number it's like you've got to land on 490 it's not yeah. like all of a sudden it's not like the uh DeLorean and Back to the Future when it hits 88 miles an hour it goes <laughs> into the next orbit it's not that it, it doesn't nope. work like that so you know the deer doesn't know if you've got 20 grains more in there or not so you know accuracy is always going to win I'm always going to be the guy that tells you whether you're shooting 420 or you're shooting 550 accuracy always wins it's always going to make up for you know like uh you know a poor shot so accuracy always wins when you got accuracy, you got confidence. A quiet uh, always helps, and all these things to help you with accuracy is FOC, a heavier arrow, quieter arrow. So it just tends to lean towards that. I said heavier, not necessarily heavy. Mm -hmm. but in my opinion, uh, you know, you don't start talking about a heavy arrow until you get over six hundred grains. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I mean, I like that four fifty to five fifty that that window. I mean, I'm never going to say like. Oh, dude, 455, you're shooting too light, man. And <laughs> you're shooting too light. I'm not going to say that. I mean, yeah. there's, it, it lets you know that if you're if you're clicking off all the check marks, you know, the feet per second, your draw length, the pounds that you want to pull, the quietness of your bow, the FOC that you want, and you end up at 455, more power to you, especially. The only time I would tell someone to go a little heavier or uh, definitely lean more, you know, to a, a – an extreme FOC somewhere mm -hmm. in that 18, 19 is when you get into bigger critters, you know, talking yep. about like an elk, a moose, uh, a grizzly bear, uh, maybe some really large boar hog, something like that, where you, you know, you would benefit from that, but anything in that mule deer style and less, man, you're, you're good to go. Yeah. I, man, I, it's funny you say all of that because literally at the shop last time I was there, I met a guy that's, I don't, I don't know what, exactly he did but he pretty much told me he's been in the arrow game for like 30 years and so i was telling them about you know how i've been doing a sort of like arrow weight series right like i started with troy i'm ending it with you because you have always been my go-to person when it comes down to arrow built and i know you've probably told me the same thing like 50 times so i'm sorry about that that's all right but uh me and this guy were talking and I was telling him, I was like, yeah, you know, I'm kind of thinking, cause I'm going hog hunting this summer. So I was like, I'm kind of thinking about building, you know, I don't know, mid 500, you know, 550, 560, um, building a setup like that for hogs. And he looked at me all weird. He's like, why? I was like, cause man, they're, you know, tough and all this. And he's like, dude, look, I was hunting hogs down in Florida with a 400 grain arrow zipping through them. No problem. And it's stories like that you hear. 
And it, it just really circles back to everyone's got different experiences and different setups are going to work for them. That's why I used to say to my buddies, you know, they'd be like, oh, I got this new aero build and it's, I don't know, four, let's just say 440, right? Three years ago, I'd have been like, oh, that's too light. Yeah, you're not going to get any penetration. Oh, you're using a mega meat? Yeah, you're definitely not going to get anything with that, right? Because of the big blades and less weight. Now, dude, I'm like, hey, go for it. Try it. That's good. Yeah. So, yeah, it, now, you know, I mean, if it if it's if you're talking like meat hogs and stuff like that, you probably you probably are OK. However, if you, there's a potential of shooting a large boar or whatever, I would probably steer towards I'm not saying you can't do it, but I would steer more towards a heavier arrow somewhere oh, yeah. 500 and or, you know, a mechanical may not be the best best thing for that. You know, a single bevel broadhead is going to do you a lot a lot better justice as far as a big boar hog you know a 250 pound plus boar hog you know if you have to go through that shield you know you're, you're going to want something that it, it, it's no secret that a single bevel broadhead does penetrate better yeah you know but uh you know as far as the, the cutting the slicing and the way it opened it up the hole it does do a better job i'm not going to say that but for that particular application but um you know mechanicals work extremely well with you know deer and mule deer and and things like that and everybody says well what if you hit that shoulder bone or the leg bone i know you know troy talks about that a lot and i'm like you're in trouble anyway you yeah. know what i mean o odds are you know even with the single bevel there's not stuff there that you're going to be hitting it, it was a bad shot so you need to work more on confidence and accuracy mm -hmm. and quietness and those kind of things uh, is going to uh, be more beneficial to you as far as being successful than shooting something that shoots a group like this that penetrates well. I'd rather see someone that backs up on three inches of penetration and can accurately hit like that. Yep. Way more better as far as confidence and everything. Yeah. I mean, I literally lived that this year. Like I yep. had perfect confidence. And this was just one of those weird, one of those weird moments. Like I told you earlier, I, hit, I broke an arrow on a dove. Um, I thought, and if you look at the photos, I may have sent them to you. I think I did. Um, I thought I killed her. You look at the photos, she should be dead. Yeah. But I think I hit the shoulder, didn't realize it. I watched her run off with the arrow. And next thing you know, a week later, she's back and she's alive. Never found her. Yeah. And, you know, you hit something like that, whether it's fixed blade, because it was a fixed blade, or it's mechanical, or whatever you may have problems, you know? I, and oh, yeah, I mean, it, no matter what it is, you, the, the, you potentially could have problems because it's a, I mean, the animals are moving, they're taking steps, uh, arrow flight, hitting a twig. I mean, there's all kinds of variables, but, you know, we owe it to ourselves on the front end. I tell people this all the time. It's hard to paint this picture, but as soon as you cut that arrow loose, the responsibility is, is off of you, mm -hmm. meaning like you can't do anything about it where you can do is all the pre preparation, meaning like what am I going to do to put the odds in my favor to increase my opportunities and my chances of, of killing this critter? Yeah. You know, there's, there's pros and cons and there's, there's all these decisions are weighing out. Not that none of them are wrong. It's just, you know, if you're going to choose this broadhead, you may need to choose a, a little heavier arrow. So, you know, make, make good decisions on the front end. I don't want to, by saying that, I don't want people to think like, man, this bow hunting is just too much to think about. It's actually fun kind of yeah. building these concoctions. But at the end of the day, you're going to see, you know, accuracy is always going to win. You put that joker, no matter if you're shooting a field point or a two inch single, a two inch wide single bevel or a, you know, a four bladed two and a half inch mechanical, you put yeah. that joker where it's supposed to be. And more times than not, you're going to recover your game. That's, that's, you know, point blank. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've been, I've been, have, have to have been, okay. I can't speak. Thor has had to get me back on track when I go down that rabbit hole a lot, you know, cause I'll yeah. talk to him about stuff. JD's done it. A lot of my buddies will be like, Hey man, look, you're overthinking this. And that's just my personality. Right. Yeah. Um, cause I want to have the best thing for the animal. So I'm not, you know, out here just wounding animals. Um, I will say though, that my experience with broadheads, and this is going to lead into something that I want, I've, I should have asked you a long time ago, but my experience this past season with broadheads was kind of interesting. So before we partnered up with VPA, I was shooting the mega meat. And now, you know, on 
those clips, right? You're supposed to change those out after every kill, right? Yeah. Okay. They I give you, they give you extra in the pack. Oh, I know. And I had yeah. them, but I didn't. So the same broadhead that I killed pickles with, I shot a doe with this year and didn't check the blades. And when I let that arrow go, it went nine, 10 inches to the right, straight through the guts, right? Yeah. Nothing on the broadhead. It's all me. I should have checked everything. You know, I put new blades on it, but I didn't yeah. think to put the new clip on. Right. So that happened. I felt so bad. Uh, this first time I've ever gut shot a deer and I actually yeah. watched her run off and watched her bed down, got down, retrieved her the next morning. I say that because an argument you've given me before when we've debated, you know, mechanicals versus fixed blades. Had I have done that with a fixed blade, I may not have found that animal because that hole, no joke, was at least that big. Yeah. I mean, as bad as I felt, I was shocked. I was like, dude, that, that's honestly kind of amazing that a broadhead was able to do that. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, it, now, and, it, and, and honestly, like, uh, you know, a lot of times you can get away with shooting them all the way open. You know, if your setup's tuned right and, you know, yeah. you make a good shot, not a not, not hand torque and stuff like that. Um, a lot of times it, it you know, especially in, if it's under like a 25 yard shot, I, I, I've shot them just to see wide yeah. open. And it really doesn't My, change. Mine was 25 to 30 and I yeah. was very nervous. <laughs> so I probably yeah, yeah. didn't help. There's a lot of variables that go into yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. So after that, I switched just, just because I'm like, okay, I, at the time I was not mad. I was more mad at myself. And I just, you yeah, know, I get like it. I said, we partnered up with VPA, started shooting their stuff. And that single bubble stuff though, that I'm, I'm honestly shocked at how good the penetration is on that. Mm -hmm. Cause the last year that I killed was with the Omega and it went so deep in the dirt. Like I had a huge clump at the end and maybe, maybe that always happens. That's my very first pass through that wasn't through a stomach. Right. Yeah. So every other day I've shot with an arrow or with a bow um, was never a pass through. So maybe that's normal. Maybe it's not. Well, and then, and then now also you're shooting a, a, a more powerful bow for sure now too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah th this bow that you're, you know, it's, you, you've increased the kinetic energy and the foot pounds uh, considerably. So it, it's going to be a lot different as well. Yeah. And I mean, I want to try a mega meat on a pig this year because I still have some. Right. Yeah. So when we go to um, public land this year and go hunt them, I really want to try them out and see, you know, yeah, what you, they should can be, you should be fine with an average size or smaller. I mean, I've killed a bunch of pigs with them before, but you know, I mean, like I'll be the first to tell you and you know, I, I, no pun intended. I bleed the confidence in a mega meat, <laughs> Yeah. but, uh, but, <laughs> but for, a, you know, for a hog, you know, unless you're developing a, a ton of uh, kinetic energy pulling, you know, really high 70 pounds or something, you take a 250, 300 pound, you know, hog and you get dead center of that, uh, the shield right behind the shoulder and you yeah. may have some troubles for sure. You, you might have some troubles with a mega meat. So, you know, I, I mean, I know that if, if I, there was a good chance of me shooting something that big, I don't know that I would, you know, even shoot a mega meat myself. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, we go back to different applications call for different things, but for the meat and potatoes of what everybody shoots across this country, which is white tailed deer, mule deer, uh, you know, elk is if you're a meat and potatoes type of hunter where you're 28 inch to 31 inch draw pulling 70 pounds, that mega meat is going to serve the masses extremely well. Yeah. I mean, it, I still recommend it to people when that, when they say, Hey, we're broadhead. Obviously I say VPA, yeah. but when they're like, Oh, I don't want to do fixed blade. That's the first one I go to. Cause I'm yeah. like, dude, let me send you this photo from a couple of years ago. Look at the size of this. And then I send them the doe photo and they're like, Okay, I don't want to do that, but that's crazy, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, yeah. so I guess before we wrap it up, because I do have one thing that's not hunting related, I want to ask you um, sure. the last hunting related thing. Would you say that the broadhead in the whole build of the arrow is the most important part because that's the only part, or I guess the first part that hits the animal? Uh, if you had question. to choose one, Man, it's a system. I mean, I, I can't sit here and I can't sit here with a gun to my head and tell you that it it is extremely important. Yeah. But, you know, without the right arrow, a good, uh, you know, a good, strong arrow behind it, the right mm -hmm. weighted arrow. And if the you don't get if you don't get the broadhead in the right place, 
it's going to give you problems. And if the air is flying bad and, you know, hits sideways, you lose kinetic energy. So mm-hmm. no matter if you got a single bevel, if you hit it sideways, it can't penetrate, you know, it's like yeah. a shank and a nail. So, man, I know that ain't the answer you're looking for. I mean, it'd be real easy to me to go, yeah, boy, you got to have that good broad head, man. <laughs> you can't do that. So, so, uh, no, I, I'm I mean, clipping that. <laughs> God, it's, yeah. It's, it's all so important. Meaning, yeah. The fletchings, the right arrow, the right weighted arrow, the right spined arrow, the right amount of FOC. I mean, it is a system. It's all so important. And that that's, I guess that's one thing that makes me uh, love archery so much. It's just a, it's a concoction. You know, you get down in that laboratory and you're sitting there just building up a witch's <laughs> brew of what you're going to hunt with and such, man. I just, I just love it, you know, um, you know, and, and, and the number one ingredient and I, I sound like a broken record, but is accuracy, man. I, I mean, know. accuracy is, you know, and and, yeah. and there's a lot of things that, you know, you're splitting hairs. You're like, oh, well, that's not going to make that much. Well, you know, you split enough hairs, you can take your group from an eight-inch group to a two-inch group mm-hmm. by splitting 15 different hairs. That's a lot. Yeah. That's that makes a, a lot difference. of difference from 20 yards to 50 yards. Yeah. Yeah, so accuracy, I mean, God, I wish I could sit here and – you know, I, I do say this, you know, backing up, if we're taking the arrow out of the equation, you know, the two most important things other than the bow uh, to choose accessory wise is a rest is yep. the most important. And then the next would be the release. Those two things have to be extremely well machined, extremely tight tolerances and work so consistently because if those don't work consistency, you can spend eight hundred dollars on a site and it ain't gonna make up for a poor flying arrow or a poorly performing arrow rest so spend your money on a great arrow rest and spend your money on a good release and then you can aim with a toothpick i mean don't get me wrong we all like nice sights yeah and they do help us but if the at the end of the day you want that arrow in the system to be consistent so uh you know a good a good bow and then a good rest and a good release and then spend more money on your arrow setup, you know, and the thing to kind of trim the fat, so to speak, is stabilizers, quivers, sights. Those are things that you can fluctuate from $30 to $400. You don't need a $400 quiver. You don't need, you know, all these stabilizer systems. You don't have to have all that. They are nice, but the things you got to have is a good set of arrows, broadheads, a release, and of course the arrow rest. Yeah, see, you know, that was the answer that I wanted. <laughs> yeah. Here's why. Because what I what I see a lot of, and, and I'm not trying to knock anybody, but what I see a lot of is people like to focus on one specific thing. They'll say, oh, this degree of your vein will make it 10 times more accurate. Or this specific knock turn just this way. It's going to be perfect. This one broadhead is better than all the others. And it's like, you can't, like you said, it's a system. You can't do yeah. that. You have to have a, it's it's kind of like, I, I like to relate it to a car. You take a car that's got a built engine. Well, if you have an aluminum bottom end and a stock top end, eventually a stock top end is not going to be able to handle it. Right. So you have to either go all aluminum or you have to, you, you know what I'm saying? You have to have yeah. everything working correctly. So yeah, there, that answer is perfect. I mean, yeah, it, it, it's a pro and con approach. I mean, that's the way I do with everything. Pros and cons, like mm-hmm. by changing this knock, what are my advantages? And then what are my disadvantages and how big are the disadvantages? And that's where you, you know, you, you know, naturally, if we had, everybody had stupid kind of money, you, you know, you definitely buy all the good things. But, yeah. you know, if you're working off of a budget, like most of us are, you know, you, you pick and choose where you want to spend the money on, on things that you're going to get the most benefit out of. And, yep. you know, the things I mentioned before, are those uh, that that's what's going to serve you better. Well, T-Bone, that's why I wanted you to be the end all be all on this arrow series that I've been doing, because again, you, you tell it like it is, you don't try to pander to one set of people to another. You, you like you say, the meat and potatoes, the Billy Joe lunch bucket, that, that is, I feel like the majority of the hunting community. So oh, yeah. thank you for doing that. Now yeah. all that hunting stuff's cool, right? great thing we love it before we wrap it up i was listening to you on wcb and kurt had mentioned how you guys talk about ufc a lot oh yeah now i personally don't really follow ufc much after mcgregor did his whole thing and that whole that 
all of that, right? Right. But I am curious, and I kind of relate it because it's fighting. Jake Paul, Mike Tyson. What's your opinion on that? Uh, I think, I mean, I'm sure it's just a super fight to make a lot of money, but, uh, you know, I'm I'm of the era and of the age, about the same age as Mike Tyson. I'm pulling for Mike Tyson to absolutely obliterate him. And I, and I think he can. Yeah. Uh, and I think he, I mean, you know, if, if everything is on the up and up and there's, you know, no money, you know, you know, nobody got bought out or it's not, you know, some WWE type thing. Yeah. I, I think Mike Tyson obliterates him. I mean, absolutely just destroys him, destroys him. I mean, yeah, I'm I agree. Saying, I will give, you know, Jake and Logan credit that they have, <clears throat> they have, turned themselves and trained to where they do look pretty decent and they are decent, oh, yeah. but the people they're fighting are not, you know, matched as far as weight and age and things like that. So, yeah. you know, they're, they're kind of swaying the fights towards their side. So, uh, yeah, the only one that he really fought that was legit was, uh, uh, gosh. Uh, with who, who fought who I'm talking about Jake or Logan? Jake fought uh oh um the the fighter uh I should know this oh man I am totally <laughs> the Gypsy King Gypsy King who is that yeah <laughs> that's it I can't remember his name <laughs> it, well his, his Gypsy King it's his younger brother he fought the younger brother oh the, yeah the, yeah yeah I know I yeah, know he, the he, name he's the uh dang it. I can't. Is it Tyler? Not Tyler. Is it a Fury brother? Yeah, Fury. Okay, yeah. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Tyler Fury. Younger Fury. Yeah. Yeah. The younger yeah, yeah. Fury is who he fought. Whereas the older one, the uh, old Tyson Fury. Tyson, yeah. Tyson Fury is the one that is the heavyweight champion. The, the younger one is the one th that's the only <laughs> legit fighter that is in the wheelhouse of either yeah. one. Of them, you know, and he lost. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to lie, Jake. I feel like out of the two Paul brothers, Jake is definitely more of a fighter. I think Logan just does it for, you know, clout. But I think he's done with WWE now. So he, he did, yeah. yeah. So we kind of – I mean, nothing against them. I, I don't know them from Adam, but I used to hate Jake just out of his personality. But here recently, I feel like he's kind of growing up more and starting to maybe calm down a little bit. thing yeah. is, you're absolutely crazy to get in the ring with Mike Tyson, especially after I've seen these videos of Tyson training. Dude, I wouldn't fight him in a wheelchair, much less when he's There's actually no up way. in. There's no way, man. He yeah, is, yeah. If if the younger generation, those that are under thirty years old, wants to know anything about Tyson, you need to go to YouTube and look. Some, I mean, the the man was scary. <clears throat> he's still he scary. <laughs> not flashy. He'd come out there in black Reeboks and black trunks with a towel over his head, no yep. robe. No flashiness, and he would do work, son. I mean, work. Yeah, he is an animal. Oh man, he. Yeah, I. I I'll be praying for Jake. Let's just say yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. I just man. got a feeling. I just got a feeling it's going to be a commercialized thing, you know. And, oh yeah. yeah well, and sure. that's the thing. Me and my wife talked about it, and I was like, "Oh, Paul's fighting Tyson," and she was like, "Yeah, it's probably it's probably either rigged or it's going to be, you know." one of those you pay a ton of money the thing is a lot of people are saying that they don't want to pay for the pay-per-view or pay for whatever they got to pay for just for tyson to walk out there and knock him out in the first 10 seconds yeah because i know he used to do that back in the day so like he could yeah still <laughs> so. it's one of those things man they're great about promoting and they're you know they're it's like the train wreck you can't you know like man i don't care nothing about that man they make me mad and then secretly you're like this yep. you buy the pay-per-view i gotta watch <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. We agreed we're not going to pay for it. Like I told her the other day, I was like, I won't pay for the fight. Yeah. But you better believe the next day I'm going to go on YouTube and watch the highlights just oh, because absolutely. I want to know. Yeah. So I'll probably, I'll cave at the last minute. I'll probably end up buying it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know we're probably going to get invited. Like there's a buddy of mine that uh, is like a family friend. He always buys the fights, uh, especially UFC fights, yeah. which I'll get into. That's the thing. Like we don't have cable or anything like that. Yeah. And, so if if a fight's on, I'm watching it. I just don't oh, know yeah. who it is. You yeah. know, I'm like, oh yeah, that Russian dude. I'm going for him, and then yeah, that's it, right? Yeah. Um. So I told her I was like, I'm not buying it, but I will be watching the highlights, and I'm sure it'll be all over Instagram. Um, oh yeah. Are there any big UFC fights coming up? I think 
I heard about yeah, 300. 300 is in two weeks. Who's going to be on that card? Uh, uh, it's it's a great card. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, Jim Miller. He's a, a bow hunter. He's a good friend. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's it, it'll be his. He's fought. He fought on UFC 100. He fought on UFC 200. And now he'll fight on UFC 300. He's got oh, wow. more fights in the UFC than anybody. So, you know, he's pretty um, – he, he's not one of the higher decorated, but as far as longevity and, and real well like yeah. on there, yeah, there's there's a lot of good good fights on there. It's going to be a stacked card for sure. Isn't uh, Cody Durden going to be on an upcoming card? Uh, Cody Garbrandt? No, Cody Durden. He's from Covington. He, oh. uh, he hangs out with uh, Jay Maxwell and all that. Oh, okay. I, I, I actually, I'm not familiar with him, oh, but okay. well. <laughs> I know Cody Garbrandt is. Yeah. 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 I've heard of Garbrandt. He, um, all those dudes, man, it blows my mind too. Cause like, I, I feel like I could hold my own if I needed to, <laughs> but then I watch them and I'm like, no, uh, uh-uh. I don't know anything that, yeah. that street fighting and that fighting is completely different. Yeah. It's, it's tough. been a few years. So I don't know, man. I, I don't really like to fight. I like to watch it. I don't like to do it. Yeah. <laughs> But I'm cool, man. Well, look, Bone, I appreciate you coming on, dude. I'm sorry, yeah, man. I'm bugging you. <laughs> no problem, man. Um, but yeah, man. So, why don't you tell everybody what you're going to be getting into before we wrap this up? You know, what can we expect from Bone Collector? Is there a new season coming out soon? Are there more episodes coming out soon? Yeah, uh, we do. Yeah, Bone Collector. Yeah, we do 23 originals every year. We actually, uh, we're a full season show. A lot of the shows are just third and fourth quarter. So, You'll see about uh, half the new episodes, first and second quarter. The other ones you'll see, uh, we'll introduce them in third and fourth quarter. So all the hunts, uh, and I think, I think we're kind of showing turkey shows now that are new. And then uh, I think you'll see a lot of new deer hunts coming out in July. Um, BoneCollector.com got all kinds of uh, merchandise and stuff. You can go by there and take a look, as well as. Uh, on realtree.com and then you know following me t-bone outdoors on facebook i finally got my facebook page it got hacked back in november and i finally oh, got man. it back about two weeks ago man you want to talk about a nightmare that was so tough you 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 cannot just pick up the phone and talk to anybody at facebook yeah. but i hired a company out of south florida and we got it back so i was really happy about that um facebook instagram twitter and tiktok you know t-bone outdoors and yeah we just uh, stay up to date we'll be throwing archery tips and all kinds of little knickknack paddywhack stuff. Give a dog a bone. So, uh, <laughs> oh, same, a lot of the same, you know, outdoor stuff and outdoor management and land management and plowing dirt and growing deer and all that kind of stuff. So we, yeah, we're doing a lot more of the same stuff. I love it. Uh, the last thing I want to ask you, and this is more of a favor really to me, but is there any small chance, any chance in the world, when, because you know, me and JD both shoot ASA, we'll be at the state championship down by you guys this year. Uh -huh. Is there any chance of us getting a sighting of the old bone out there making an appearance yeah. at the at at Scott Parrott's place over there at Redneck Bow Hunter? I think so. I don't know. I know the state river, river by you guys River that's Bend. Big. That's what it is. I think I it's think. river. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Actually, we talked about that. Yeah. He sets it up to where you can get around on a. You know. Uh. I can take the. We can take the golf, the buggy over there and yeah. shoot from the buggy or whatever. Yeah, that, that could happen for sure. I almost right. did it last year, but it was going to rain the day that we went. So uh, that's why we didn't go. Yeah. Like we literally were going to go to this because the state championship last year was 20 minutes from my house over yeah. with Ace in them. Yep. And dude, I, I just, we just didn't go. And yeah. looking back, I'm like, dang it, man, I should have gone. It's so, so fun. Yeah. They yeah, are. We're going to, I still haven't gone. I haven't had any time, honestly, yeah. to go any of the qualifiers. But there's another qualifier in Kennesaw uh, June, I think. So I'm going to be going to that. That way I can at least get to the state. Shoot. Sure. So I'll be on the lookout for you. Um, okay. If you hear me scream your name from like a quarter mile down. Uh, we'll be in touch, man. We'll know. <laughs> I know we will. <laughs> yeah. Awesome, dude. Well, I appreciate you coming on, but we need to do this again. Um, I don't know. Whenever you want. Sounds good, man. I appreciate it. You have a good one. Thanks you for having me on. Yes, sir. Always.